Hello students and welcome to Political Science 1513, American Federal Government Online. Once again, I am your instructor, Connor Alford, and this week we're going to be elaborating on a concept that we've already introduced, that of federalism. Now you will remember that federalism is one of the seven core constitutional principles that we covered when we were talking about our Charter of Government, its main components, its core principles and provisions. But this particular principle is somewhat more complicated in a variety of ways than some of those other core principles. So what I've decided to do is to separate our discussion of federalism out into its own distinct week of lecture and reading content. Towards that end, our lecture for this week will have seven main learning objectives, which I would like for you to focus on as you listen to this lecture and begin taking notes. Our seven learning objectives are as follows. Number one, distinguish between levels and branches of government. Number two, describe the nature of federalism and the distribution of lawmaking authority in the three main systems of government. Number three, detail the historical progression of federalism in our country and the importance of the elastic or necessary and proper clause to this process. Number four, distinguish between the two main types of federalism and their respective metaphors. Number five, Identify the main types of powers, their synonyms and constitutional sources in our system of government. Number six, explain the supremacy clause and the hierarchy of laws that it creates. And finally, we will close today's lecture by discussing some of the pros and cons of federalism. Let's go ahead and get started at the beginning. And to do that, I'm going to refresh your memory with a definition from last week's lecture. Remember that federalism might be defined as, and I quote, the sharing and dividing of power or lawmaking authority across multiple distinct levels of government. But to fully understand what we mean by the sharing and dividing of power across different levels of government, we need to know what exactly a level of government is. And we need to be able to distinguish the concept of a level of government from the concept of a branch of government. So remember that in addition to federalism, another core constitutional principle is that of separated powers. Federalism and separated powers are somewhat similar, but distinct, and I don't want you to get discombobulated. Remember that the concept of separated powers tells us that the three core functions of all operational governments must at all times be kept separated across distinct branches of government. So we will have a legislative branch, which legislates, an executive branch, which administrates, and a judicial branch, which adjudicates. Each of these three branches of government is distinguished from the other two by its core mission. So examples of branches of government include legislative, executive, and judicial. And remember that each of these distinct branches is defined not by its level, not by its degree of locality, but by its core constitutional function. If it operates to create the law, then it is the legislative branch. If it operates to execute and enforce the law, then it is the executive branch. And if it operates to resolve disputes about how the law should be interpreted and applied to particular cases, well then you're looking at the judicial branch. Branches of government are not the same thing as levels of government. Because where branches of government are distinguished from one another by their core constitutional function, levels of government are distinguished from one another by their degree of locality. In other words, the difference between one level of government and another has to do with how much territory that particular government is expected to run or operate over. For example, at the very lowest level we have city governments. Here in Durant, Oklahoma, we have a city council, and that city council is responsible for running our very local community in Durant. That's a very low level of government because it's extremely localized. The Bryan County government is slightly less localized, so we say that it is a somewhat higher level of government. Then we've got the government for the state as a whole, that's even higher. And then the highest level of government is going to be the federal government, which is very centralized, which is not very localized at all because it is responsible for running the entire country. Do note that different levels of government can each contain separate branches of government. So at the federal level, we have three distinct branches of government, the legislative, judicial, and executive. All three of these are going to be responsible for running our country as a whole, 
But remember that while they're running our country, each one is contributing its own function to this broader process. The same thing is going to be true at the state level of government. Here in Oklahoma, we do make our own laws. We have our own legislative branch. We also administrate those laws because we have our own executive branch for the state of Oklahoma. And yes, Oklahoma has its own court system. So at the state level, we have three branches. And at the federal level, we have three branches. But remember that examples of the distinct levels of government will always be distinguished from one another by their degree of locality. The city, the county, the state, the federal government, these are levels. Executive, legislative, judicial, these are branches. So that's the difference between a level of government on the one hand, a branch of government on the other hand. And that's also going to help segue into our second learning objective. Because remember that for learning objective two, you have to explain the nature of federalism, which we've already done in very general terms, and you need to be able to describe how federalism is distinct from the two main alternatives. So remember, in federalism, we're going to share and divide lawmaking authority across different levels of government. But that's not how everyone else operates in their particular countries. So let's look at some of the alternatives to federalism. On one extreme, we have the unitary system of government, and a unitary government or unitary system is one in which a country is operated as a single unit by one centralized federal government which exercises and maintains virtually all lawmaking authority so that it can maintain uniformity in policies regardless of where a citizen happens to live. Some modern examples of unitary governments include China and France. It doesn't matter whether you live in southern France or northern France. Every Frenchman follows the same set of rules, and all of these rules are going to be created not by their local governments, but by their federal, national government. We actually operated in our country under this unitary system way back when we were still colonies because the British Empire concentrated virtually all lawmaking authority into the hands of the central government. In that case, the central government was made up of a parliament and a king, but the point here that I want you to understand is that at the end of the day, if a local government in the empire tried to make a policy that the federal government did not like, the federal government just told them no, because states or local and regional governments within the empire didn't really have any lawmaking authority. If they were making any rules at all, that was because the federal government gave them permission to do so. But it could also withdraw that permission. So I don't want you to walk away with the impression that in a unitary system like France or the British Empire or China, there is no state or local government within the country. That's not necessarily true. If you look at France, for example, we're going to find that individual cities like Paris do have their own local governments. But what I want you to understand about the unitary system is that those local governments do not, generally speaking, hold very much, if any, lawmaking authority. And whatever lawmaking authority they do exercise is given to them by the federal government. So they are dependent upon the federal government for any discretion that they are allowed to exercise. In a unitary system, the federal government's job is to make a single body of laws that applies uniformly across the country. State and local governments are not supposed to be creating laws. Instead, by and large, their job is to simply take those laws from the federal government and administrate them on the ground level. So, for example, in France, the national government has said that nobody's allowed to smoke weed. So the government in Paris is supposed to make sure that Parisians aren't getting high on the streets. But it doesn't really have the authority to do the types of things that we see in the United States where certain cities are allowing their citizens to smoke weed or certain states are allowing their citizens to ingest marijuana. That's not how things work in a unitary system. You have one body of laws and it's simply being implemented by the state and local governments. Of course, this is not the only system that we tried before we arrived at our compromise. This is not, in other words, the only system of sharing or distributing the powers of government across different levels that we experimented with before we decided to adopt federalism. Prior to the adoption of our constitution, our country worked as a sort of confederacy. You will remember that the first charter of government in our country was the Articles of Confederation. 
and under the Articles of Confederation, for the first decade or so of our nation's history, we were essentially a confederacy. A modern example of the confederacy might be the European Union. But whether you're looking at the 13 states that banded together to fight the British Empire, or the European Union, which has created a centralized government to help coordinate European states in their policymaking efforts to address big problems like global warming and immigration, a confederacy might be defined as a group of independent or sovereign states and nations that yield some of their power to a national government, but which ultimately retain all or most lawmaking authority to themselves. So again, let's go ahead and look at the way in which our country was operated under the Articles of Confederation. During this time, each individual state, whether we're looking at Virginia and Georgia or North and South Carolina, retained its ultimate lawmaking authority. But the different states recognized that if they didn't cooperate with one another, they were going to lose out to the British Empire during the Revolutionary War. Gaining independence was a problem too big for the states to handle on their own, and they knew that they couldn't win if it was a free-for-all in which every man fought for his or herself. Rather, I should say, they knew that if each state was fighting on its own and they weren't coordinating their efforts, they were going to lose. Faced with a problem too big for them to address individually, they delegated some authority to a central government. And under this system, the central government's job was to help these distinct states exercise their respective powers in a synergetic manner. In other words, in a confederacy, you can think of the central government as a sort of advisory council. Each individual state is going to send a delegate, a representative, to that central government. These representatives of the states will then get together and talk about what the country as a whole needs to do in order to achieve its collective goals. In our case, the collective goal was to gain independence, and so the central government might decide that we need to levy a new tax so that we can pay our soldiers. That seems like a really important thing during a revolutionary fight for independence, but remember from prior lecture, the central government could not directly tax the citizens of any of the individual states. Instead, it would publish a requisition, and the requisition was a request sent to each individual state in the Confederacy asking those states to exercise their lawmaking authority to create taxes for their citizens and then to take some of that money and send it to the central government. But remember that individual states didn't have to comply with this, and generally speaking, that's how a Confederacy works. In a confederacy, you will note from this diagram, the citizens of each state are going to follow a body of laws created by their state government. But by and large, they aren't following laws created by the federal government. The federal government makes suggestions to the states about what types of laws they can make, and generally the states will agree to comply with these recommendations, in exchange for the benefits of being able to cooperate with one another, but they retain virtually all lawmaking authority. So to summarize, what I need you to understand is that federalism is a compromise between two distinct extremes. On one end of the spectrum, we have the unitary system, which says that we should give virtually all lawmaking authority to the national or federal government. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got the confederal system, which says that we should give all of the lawmaking authority not to the national or federal government, but to the state and local governments. Our system is a compromise between these two extremes, in that instead of giving all lawmaking authority to one level or the other, we share and divide that lawmaking authority across both the state and federal level. So today what we're going to find is that if you are an Okie, like myself, then you're going to follow multiple bodies of laws made by different levels of government. I have to follow the laws of the city of Durant, Oklahoma, because I'm a Durantula, y'all. And I also have to follow the laws of the state of Oklahoma, because I'm an Okie. But while I'm following the laws of my city and the laws of my state, I'm also going to have to follow the laws of my country. Because in addition to being a proud Durantula and a proud Okie, I am a proud U.S. citizen. I'm an American. And I take that very seriously. But it's important for our purposes here because what that means is that the citizens of the various states and cities are going to be following multiple, sometimes overlapping bodies of law. In a federal system, citizens in one city will follow the laws of that city, whereas citizens in another city will not. For example, 
If you live in Durant, you follow the laws of Durant, but you do not follow the laws of McAllister, Oklahoma. And if you live in the laws of McAllister, then you don't follow the laws of Durant. But whether you live in McAllister or Durant, these are both Oklahoma cities, and so you're going to follow the laws of Oklahoma. Now, if you are a Texan and you live in the state of Texas, you don't have to follow the laws of Oklahoma. But you do have to follow the laws of Texas, and just like the Oklahomans, you do have to follow the laws of the federal government. So federalism is a little bit more complicated than the alternatives, because in a unitary system, you follow one body of laws, the laws made by your federal government. In a confederal system, you follow one body of laws, the laws made by your state government. But in a federal system, you follow multiple bodies of laws made by different levels of government because that lawmaking authority has been shared and divided. At this point, we've finished our first couple learning objectives, and we can begin to talk about the different types of federalism. Because what we're going to find is that while federalism in general terms might just be defined as sharing and dividing powers between distinct levels of government, there are multiple different ways in which these powers might be distributed or shared. And what we're going to find is that the original, strictly constitutional system of federalism, under which we operated for the first eh, 100 or 150 or so years of our nation's history, is not the system of federalism under which we operate today. So, the first thing I want you to know is that the first major historical trend in the history and development of federalism for our country is that we have transitioned from an early system of dual federalism to a modern system of cooperative federalism. Again, the first major historical trend in the development of federalism that you need to note is that we have gone from dual to cooperative federalism. What does that mean? Well, in a dual federal system, we have a model of federalism in which government power is clearly divided between states and federal governments with very little overlap and within which both states and the federal government are treated as co-equal sovereigns. They are sovereign powers that do not interfere in one another's sphere of authority. In other words, under dual federalism, the federal government has a set of issues that it's going to deal with, and the states have a set of issues that they are going to deal with. The states won't get involved in the federal government's business, and the federal government won't get involved in the state's business. So neither one is superior or supreme above the other. There's just a clear division of labor. Under dual federalism, for example, the federal government would deal with foreign diplomacy and war, meaning that the states weren't entering into treaties with China or with the tribes, but that the federal government was, and that the states left the federal government alone when it was dealing with federal policy. They didn't attempt to interfere. But conversely, the opposite was also true. Under dual federalism, states had basically every power not specifically delegated to the federal government by our constitution. And what that meant was that if we are talking about, for example, policing or morality policies, those were entirely in the hands of the states. The states would do things like decide what sorts of crimes they would create through their laws and how they would punish people that committed these crimes. The federal government didn't get involved in crime and punishment until much later in our history because constitutionally that was a power reserved to the states by the 10th Amendment. A dual federalism system, then, is sometimes called layer cake federalism. And that's going to become clear when we get to the next slide. But before we jump ahead and begin talking about metaphors, let's also look at the more recent system of federalism under which we live today. This system of federalism is called cooperative federalism, and we began our transition, uh, our transition from the traditional, strictly constitutional model of dual federalism to a more pragmatic, modern system of cooperative federalism under the presidency of FDR with his sweeping New Deal policies back in the 1930s and 1940s. We continue to live under cooperative federalism today, but what is cooperative federalism? Well. Cooperative federalism is a model of federalism in which states and federal power is pragmatically mixed so that different levels of government may cooperate in solving similar problems, but within which the federal government is given supremacy over the states. So we don't have co-equal separate sovereigns in cooperative federalism the same way that we do in dual federalism. The states are not considered co-equal to the federal government. The 
federal government is now supreme over the states, and they more or less need to comply with it. However, I don't want you to think that this is entirely adversarial. One way to think about the system of cooperative federalism is to imagine a team with a coach. If it's a basketball team, you know that the individual players and the coach both have the same goal. They want to win, and they're going to work together towards that end. But at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, the coach is the one drawing the plays. And if the players decide that they don't want to follow with those plays, well, then they get benched or kicked off the team. So the national government in cooperative federalism is a part of the same team as are the states, but it is the captain of this team. It's the boss of this team. So in cooperative federalism, we don't have a division of labor. Instead of saying states, you go handle issues X, Y, and Z, federal government, you go handle issues A, B, and C, we say states get together with the federal government and together we address issues A, B, and C. Then when we're done with issues A, B, and C, we're going to work together with the federal government to address X, Y, and Z. This is why we sometimes call cooperative federalism marble cake federalism. As you can see on the slide, marble cake federalism and layer cake federalism are quite distinct. On the right hand side, you see an illustration of what a layer cake looks like. And what you're going to find is that there is a clear delineation between the icing and the breading of a layer cake. So each layer of icing and breading represents a level of government. At the top, we've got a layer of icing to represent the federal government. And as you can see, it's pretty clear that there's a distinct line drawn between the icing and the breading. And the breading underneath this first layer of icing might represent the second level of government, the states. Under that, another layer of icing might represent the counties, and then a layer of breading might represent the cities, and then a layer of icing, precincts, so on and so forth, all the way down. What's important here is to understand that the powers exercised by the federal government are clearly separated from the powers exercised by the states or local governments. Whereas if you come over to the left and you look at this diagram for the marble cake federalist system, you're going to find that there's a pragmatic mixing. The federal powers are blended into the state power so that it's no longer clear where one begins and the other ends. In a layer cake, the icing and the bread are clearly delineated. They're clearly separate, and you can see where one begins and the next ends. However, today, that's not the way federal and state powers are divided. Instead, it's more like a marble cake where the icing is imbibed and imbued and mixed with the actual breading and therefore swirls in and out, and it's not clear where federal power or icing and state power or breading begin or end. They're mixed together. And this can sometimes cause some confusion because it becomes difficult to figure out where states are supposed to act in what way and where the federal government is supposed to act in what way. But again, what I want you to understand is that this marble cake federalism is more accurately depicting the way federalism works in practice today, whereas this layer cake federalism is a more accurate depiction of how it is supposed to work constitutionally speaking and how it worked for the first 150 or so years in our nation's history. But now we can begin to talk about the second major historical trend that you need to be familiar with. And this second major historical trend that you need to write into your notes is quite simply this. Over time, the powers of the federal government have grown relative to the states. In other words, the federal government has gotten more powerful, states have gotten weaker. Why is this happening? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at the Constitution, the types of government power that it creates, the specific constitutional provisions dealing with these types of power and how they can be organized and understood. Towards that end, let's start by identifying the three main broad categories of government power created in our constitutional system. By and large, government power in our constitutional system can be separated into one of three ca categories. We have federal powers, state powers, and we have shared powers. State powers are sometimes called reserved powers. Shared powers are sometimes called concurrent powers. Whereas federal powers can be further subdivided into one of two categories. We have the delegated, enumerated, or expressed powers, and we have the inferred and implied powers. So a delegated power is the same thing as an enumerated power, and an enumerated power is the same thing as an expressed power. These are all synonymous.
Inferred and implied powers are also synonymous. And delegated or inferred powers are each going to be a subcategory within the broader category of federal power. Let's break this down in, uh, in better detail. Originally, under dual federalism, the only powers held by the federal government were the enumerated or delegated powers. An enumerated or delegated power is a power which has been explicitly enumerated, listed by name, by the Constitution, in which the Constitution explicitly or expressly delegates to the federal government. In other words, an enumerated power is a federal power specifically mentioned in the Constitution. By contrast, an implied or inferred power is a power of the federal government which is never explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but which the federal government exercises anyway. And generally speaking, the foundation for all inferred or implied powers in our country is what we have come to call the Elastic Clause. Now, the Elastic Clause is more properly known as the Necessary and Proper Clause. But we call it the Elastic Clause because its language is extremely vague, and this vagary makes it easy to stretch or twist the meaning to suit your needs. The Necessary and Proper Clause basically says that in addition to any enumerated powers, the federal government shall have the authority to exercise whatever powers are necessary for the execution of those enumerated functions. So, for example, one of the enumerated powers of the federal government is to provide for the common defense, to build a military with which to fend off foreign aggressors. But if you want to build a military so that you can provide for the common defense, one thing you absolutely have to have are soldiers. You don't necessarily have to pay them. Maybe they're going to be volunteers, but you do have to have soldiers if you want to build an army. And so the Necessary and Proper Clause would say that because you have to recruit soldiers in order to build an army, because recruitment is necessary to the common defense, the federal government has the implied power to recruit so that it may actually exercise its enumerated power to provide for the common defense. Now this is going to become very important because that necessary and proper clause is going to be interpreted by the Supreme Court through a series of cases beginning with McCulloch v. Maryland in 1819 to dramatically expand federal power. Remember the Supreme Court of the United States is itself an organ of the federal government and it has the authority to resolve disputes about the law. So it resolved the dispute about how to interpret the Constitution, starting in the case of McCulloch v. Maryland, to create the concept of implied powers. Remember, under dual federalism, at the very beginning of our nation's history, it was understood that there were no implied powers. All powers not explicitly delegated to the federal government were reserved to the states. And so what that meant was that in McCulloch v. Maryland, the Supreme Court was essentially interpreting the Necessary and Proper Clause in order to invent a new category of federal power, the implied power. And this set the precedent that there were, in fact, some powers that the federal government could exercise, even though it was never explicitly authorized to do so by the Constitution. The particular powers that fall into this category have been expanded over time. So that today, most of what the federal government does is done under the implied powers created by the Supreme Court through its interpretation of the Elastic Clause, starting in McCulloch v. Maryland. What I want you to note about McCulloch v. Maryland, then, is that this case interpreted the Elastic Clause to create implied powers for the federal government. And that this creation of implied powers, starting with McCulloch v. Maryland, is the number one most important factor explaining why today the federal government is so much more powerful than the states. Keep that in the back of your mind, but don't take it too far. I do want you to understand that while the invention of implied powers through the court's interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause has been the number one factor driving the expansion of federal power relative to state power, it's not the only factor. I do want you to briefly note that there are two other major contributions to the expansion of federal power. One is fiscal federalism. Fiscal federalism is a system in which the monies raised by taxes at one level of government are spent at another level of government. 
Generally speaking, fiscal federalism means that the federal government will use its very large nationwide tax base to generate huge sums of revenue. It will then give some of this revenue over to each of the individual states so that they can spend it on projects from which they and their citizens will benefit from, like highways and infrastructure. The reason that fiscal federalism helps to expand the federal government's power is that these grants given to the states by the federal government generally come with a whole bunch of strings attached. So for example, if I asked you what is the federal drinking age required for individuals wanting to consume alcohol, you might be tempted to say that the age is 21, but that's technically incorrect. Why is that incorrect? Well, because there is no minimum drinking age mandated under federal law. Instead, every individual state in Washington, D.C. have independently exercised their own lawmaking authority to set their drinking age to exactly 21. And that's a bit surprising because you might ask yourself, why do they all agree on exactly the number 21? Shouldn't at least a couple of them say, well, maybe we ought to bump that up to 22 or maybe we ought to bump that down to 20? Shouldn't there be at least one or two states that think 18 is a sufficient age? Shouldn't there be some states that want to do what Oklahoma used to do and say that the drinking age will be 21 for men but 18 for women? Why is it that every single state has simultaneously set its uniform drinking age to exactly 21? Well, because the federal government grants each of these states certain amounts of money to help build highways and maintain roads. And the federal government has basically told states that if they want to keep receiving this money on which they've become dependent, they have to set their drinking age to 21. So fiscal federalism basically makes the federal government more powerful, the states more vulnerable, by creating a system of dependency in which the states depend upon the federal government for their sustenance and therefore the federal government can very easily boss them around by attaching strings to the money it gives them. In addition to the emergence of fiscal federalism as a system of finances in our country, however, we're going to find that the growing visibility of national leaders in general, the president in particular, also help to explain the expansion of federal power. Because modern technologies like the television, radio, and internet allow for our national leaders to broadcast themselves across the entire country and to reach national audiences. When you can reach people across the entire country and you can speak directly to them, that gives you a great deal of influence over them. So the growing visibility of national leaders due to expansions in technology have also helped to give these leaders more authority and therefore have also helped to make the federal government stronger at the expense of the states. But this is all really surprising because remember that for the first 150 or so years of our nation's history, the federal government was very weak. It was limited to a few explicitly mentioned enumerated powers explicitly delegated to the federal government by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And that reality stemmed in large part from a part of the Constitution called the Bill of Rights. Remember that the Bill of Rights is what we refer to as the first 10 amendments of the United States Constitution. And in particular, the 10th amendment reads, I quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So what is the Tenth Amendment trying to tell us? In modern English, the Tenth Amendment is basically saying that if it's not an enumerated power, it's a power reserved to the states. In other words, there are no implied powers. All powers not explicitly given to the federal government belong to the states. And once again, you will remember that this was the reality under which our country operated for the first 150 or so years of our nation's history. Clearly this has changed. So What's the difference? Well, remember that starting with McCulloch versus Maryland and then moving forward through a string of other cases, the Supreme Court of the United States has interpreted the Constitution to expand its own power and that of the federal government. Remember that there's a little bit of a contradiction here because the Tenth Amendment tells us that there are no implied or inferred powers, but that elastic clause, that necessary and proper clause, tell us, yes, there are. Remember, the Necessary and Proper Clause says that in addition to any powers explicitly enumerated, 
The federal government shall have the authority to exercise whatever power is necessary for the execution of those delegated functions. If I am authorized to build a military, I must also have the power to recruit soldiers. The power to recruit soldiers then would be an implied power, a power never explicitly mentioned, but one which I can infer from the inclusion of an enumerated authority to provide for the common defense. So the elastic clause says there are certain powers that haven't been listed in this constitution, but which nevertheless belong to the federal government. And the 10th amendment says, no, no, there are not. How do we explain this contradiction? Well, remember that the 10th amendment is a part of the bill of rights and that the bill of rights was written by the anti-federalists who wanted to limit the federal government because they thought that it would become tyrannical and oppress the poor. They wanted to empower the states at the expense of the federal government, so they actually included this 10th Amendment in their Bill of Rights intentionally as a way to counteract the Elastic Clause. Whereas the Elastic Clause is a part of Article 1 in the main body of the Constitution, and the main body of the Constitution was not written primarily by anti-federalists, but by federalists who wanted a strong federal government to help maintain law and order. So they, the Federalists, in the main body include the Elastic Clause using really vague language specifically because they wanted that language to be vague enough that it could be stretched and twisted to gradually expand the power of the federal government at the expense of the states as has been the reality. But the Anti-Federalists saw this coming and attempted to counteract that, to nullify the Elastic Clause by throwing in this Tenth Amendment which specifically says no, Contrary to the Elastic Clause, we are overriding the Necessary and Proper Clause and telling you right here and now, there are no implied powers. But one thing you have to keep in mind and that you want to pay attention to as we move throughout this semester is that the Constitution is just a piece of parchment with some text written upon it. It doesn't really have the ability to enforce or interpret itself. For interpretation, we need to turn to the courts. And what we're going to discover is that the courts, a part of the federal government, have decided to ignore the Tenth Amendment and emphasize the Elastic Clause in most cases, because that emphasis on the Elastic Clause at the expense of the Tenth Amendment expands their own power. And remember that individuals in government are always trying to increase the powers that they exercise. But that doesn't cover all of the different types of power in our constitutional system of government, because in addition to the dwindling numbers of reserved or state powers and the growing numbers of federal powers, we also have what are called concurrent or shared powers. And these are going to be powers that are utilized by both the states and the federal government on a regular basis. So for example, taxation. If you've ever held an actual proper nine to five official job in an office or service position, then you know that when it's time to file taxes, you have to do so twice. You have to file your taxes with the state and you have to file your taxes with the federal government. That's because both the states and the federal government are constitutionally authorized to levy taxes and they are gleefully exercising this power concurrently. Concurrent means simultaneously. A concurrent student is simultaneously a student at a high school and at a college. A concurrent power is simultaneously used by the federal and state governments. So now we know about the different types of power created in our system, and we know about why federal powers are expanding, but I also want to talk a little bit about the Supremacy Clause. Because one thing that you might have picked up on, if you're an especially astute reader or listener, is that we do have multiple different bodies of individuals, multiple different levels of government, all creating distinct bodies of law. And something that can happen when you have different levels of government creating laws is that these laws might come into conflict. We might have a situation where, for example, Colorado or Oklahoma says that it's okay to smoke marijuana, but the federal government says, no, no, it is not. Stop it. What do we do when there is a conflict between distinct laws passed at different levels of government? Well, to answer this question, let's look directly into our nation's charter. Let's look at the supreme law of the land. Let's look at the United States Constitution. And in particular, let's look at Article 6, Section 2, where we find the following clause. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, 
and all treaties made which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. What does this mean in modern conversational English? Well, it means that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and therefore it takes precedence over all other, land, uh, all, all other laws. But that next clause, and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, basically says that after the Constitution we have all laws created by the federal government, the United States, not the individual states, all laws created by the federal government which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. So in other words, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, followed by all laws created by the federal government which are consistent with the Constitution. And what that in turn means is that if Congress creates a law or the president signs an executive order or the Senate and the president together enter into a treaty with a foreign country and any of these conflict with the Constitution, the Constitution wins. Constitution says we have a freedom of speech. If Congress creates a law that says no freedom of speech, well, that act of Congress is illegal. It's been nullified. It's overridden by the Constitution because the Constitution takes precedent over any federal law. But if the federal law is not in violation of the Constitution, then it becomes the supreme law of the land and therefore overrides any conflicting state policy. So the supremacy clause of our Constitution is basically creating what we call the hierarchy of power and the hierarchy of power is a system or diagram that we can use to help resolve conflicts between the law. The image on your slide is a visual depiction of this hierarchy of laws and as you can see the higher a policy is on the diagram the more precedent it will take. So at the very top of these steps we have that Constitution of the United States and what that means is that the Constitution of the United States cannot be overridden by any other law, not by an act of Congress, not by a state constitution like the Constitution of Oklahoma or of Texas, and not by a state law like a law passed by the Virginia legislator, not by a city like a law passed in McAllister. The United States Constitution trumps everything so it's highest on this diagram. But after the Constitution we get an act of Congress. And what that means is that an act of Congress, a treaty, any other federal law, that is not unconstitutional can override any lower level law. So if the federal government says that we will begin allowing same-sex marriage and the Oklahoma state constitution says no same-sex marriage, well then that federal law, whether it's an act of Congress, a ruling of a court, a treaty, takes precedent and overrides the state's constitution. Conversely, if the state constitution prohibits, say, a violation of the individual's freedom of speech, but then the state of Oklahoma says no free speech, that is overridden by the state constitution. Now, of course, it would also be overridden by the United States Constitution, but in this case, we don't even have to go that far. All the way down, we have the city and county ordinances. Cities and counties like Durant or Bryan County can create some laws, but their laws must never conflict with any policy above them. So a city should not make a law that violates an act of that city's state's Congress or that state's Constitution or an act of the Federal Congress or the United States Constitution. And if it does, it's broken the law. That policy is itself illegal. Now, in theory, it's the executive branch's job to enforce and execute the law. So if a state, for example, passes a law that violates a federal policy, well then the president is, in theory, supposed to mobilize the troops. And that's usually what happens. So, for example, when the city of Little Rock in Arkansas refused to comply with a federal ruling in the United States Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, the president of the time, Eisenhower, fell upon them by mobilizing the troops and forcing them to comply. Brown versus Board of Education said no more racial segregation of public schools. Little Rock, Arkansas said, well, we're going to continue segregating our public schools. So Eisenhower sent in the National Guard and compelled them to comply. That's what's supposed to happen in theory. In practice, that's not what it always looks like. For example, plenty of states, including Oklahoma, have either completely or conditionally legalized the ingestion of marijuana. And in theory, the president, Barack Obama or Donald Trump, is not supposed to allow this to happen. But in practice, hey, our government does unconstitutional things all the time.
So now we've talked about the supremacy clause. We've talked about the different types of power, the growth of federal power. We've talked about the three major types of government, unitary, confederal, and federal. Now what we can start to do is talk about some of the arguments people have articulated both for and against federalism. I do briefly want to begin by noting that I'm not going to tell you what to think. I just want you to be familiar with the different sides' arguments. You don't have to find them all compelling. You might think some of them are stronger than others. That's fine. I, I'm not going to tell you how to feel. I just want you to be able to articulate the types of arguments that you might hear from some of the people who like federalism and the types of argument that you might hear from some of the people that do not like federalism. We'll start with the defense of federalism. So one strength that we found associated with federalism is that it's quite suitable for very large and diverse countries because it allows us to have localized special policies that cater to the unique wants and needs of particular parts of the country while also providing a strong national government which has enough power to unify disparate interests when it's necessary for us to cooperate. So let's say for example that we didn't have a federal government. Well, then it would be really, really difficult for Oklahoma and California to cooperate on any endeavor because the cultures in these different parts of our country are very, very different. The federal government allows Californians and Oklahomans to work together when it's necessary for us to do so, say, in order to defeat the Nazis during World War II. But at the same time, we need to recognize this reality. The unique wants, needs, and interests of Oklahoma, a very rural economy, and the wants, needs, and interests of California, a very urban economy, are simply not the same. And so the policies that benefit and enrich people in California are not going to correspond with the policies that benefit and enrich people in Oklahoma. So if we all had to live under, say, one economic policy, that policy would either favor the urban states like California or the rural states like Oklahoma, and somebody's going to lose out. Fortunately, federalism requires that each state create its own economic policy, so we don't have to worry about that to the same extent. Oklahoma can make policies that will give Okies what we want to need from our government, and California can make policies to give Californians what they want to need from their government. This then makes federalism uniquely well-suited for very large, diverse countries like our own. And not surprisingly then, if you look at other federalist countries throughout the world, you're going to find that they also tend to be very large and diverse. India, Russia, Germany, Canada, and Mexico all use a system of federalism modeled on ours. And again, that's because these are all very large, diverse countries who would have trouble working together in a confederacy, but who would not be able to cater to all the unique wants and needs of particular locations in their country were they a unitary system. So federalism is really, really good for large, diverse countries like our own. Federalism also helps to promote creativity through competition among the states in two distinct ways. First, we get the diffusion of innovation, and second, we get what is referred to as the laboratories of democracy function of the United States state. Let's start with that diffusion of innovation theory. The diffusion of innovation theory tells us that we will come up with better and more creative solutions to our various problems if each different state is given the ability to experiment on its own and then learn from one another. So if we have a prevailing problem, say income inequality, every individual state can create its own policy to try and address that issue. And some of these policies will work, whereas others will fail. But the states can then pay attention to one another, see which policies work and fail, and adopt these innovations that are successful while avoiding or dropping these ideas that don't actually work quite as well. So the diffusion of innovation operates when states are learning from one another's inventive solutions to old problems. At the same time, we're going to find that states operate as laboratories of democracy, meaning that when they come up with these new solutions to problems, they then test them out on a small level. And if these solutions work at the state level, then we can consider adopting them at the federal level so that we can emulate those successes on a broader scale. But if these policies fail at the local level, then the federal government knows not to try those at the national level because they've already been demonstrated not to work. So the diffusion of innovation and the laboratories of democracy function of states in our union 
both help to explain why federalism promotes creativity and policy making and problem solving by the government. But I also want to note this competition component of promoting creativity through competition. States compete with one another in order to be the best. Oklahoma, for example, has one of the lowest costs of living in the country. And because of that, we have a whole bunch of people who move here from places like California. And that's really good for our state in that these individuals coming from California are now going to take money that they could be spending in California, enriching California's economy, and they're going to spend it here in Oklahoma, where our economy will grow and create new jobs using that money and where we can tax it to do things like improve our roads, education system, so on and so forth. So Oklahoma is incentivized to try and continue excelling in its cost of living, to keep its cost of living down compared to other states so that people want to come here. We also want to make sure that we secure people's freedom and happiness because that too is going to bring people in here. But as we're drawing people out of California and Texas and other parts of the country, well, they too might draw people out of Oklahoma if they happen to get better at something that those people like than we are. For example, Texas's education system is generally considered one of the best in the entire country. And that means that a lot of people will move to Texas because they'd rather send their kids to a Texas school than an Oklahoma school. So now Oklahoma, in order to keep our state functioning, has an incentive to improve. We need to improve our schools so that people don't take their children to Texas. There's competition, and that drives perpetual improvement among the states. A final advantage to federalism that we're going to briefly talk about is that it provides a training ground for national leaders, or at least it has historically done so in our country. This isn't always true. We're going to have some individuals that throw a monkey wrench into the general rule, like Donald Trump. Donald Trump never held a public office before he became the President of the United States. But generally speaking, that's not the course of a political career for any president prior to Donald Trump. In this sense, he's very historic. But if you look at, for example, Barack Obama, you're going to find that he started as a community organizer. Then he worked his way up to the state level. The, uh, and from the state, he went to the Senate at the federal level, and then he became the president. So he started at the community, went up to the city level, went up to the state level, got to the federal level, and then became the president. Each step along the way, he was being trained. He was learning to run and operate a country, an administrative unit in that country, a community. He was learning to negotiate with people who don't see things the way he does. And that experience was a valuable resource that he could leverage once he got into the White House. So this is how our federalist system provides our future national leaders with a training ground where they can learn to be good statesmen. However, some people criticize federalism because it can create a little bit of confusion in that we will have situations where laws conflict. If somebody from France asked you, is marijuana legal in the United States, it would be difficult to answer. Because while it is true that at the national level it's still illegal to smoke weed, some states have begun allowing their citizens to do so. And of course you now know under the Supremacy Clause that's probably not what ought to be happening in a perfectly constitutional system, but it is what's happening in practice. So there's no clear or easy answer to this question, is marijuana legal in the United States? But if you asked a Frenchman or a French woman if marijuana was legal in their states, they would be able to give you a clear answer. No, marijuana is not legal in France. So unitary systems where people only have to follow one body of laws, or even confederal system where people only have to follow one body of laws, they tend to be simpler, and that means there's less confusion. Another issue with federalism, according to some of its opponents, is that it might empower states to interfere with national policies. Now again, whether or not this is bad depends on your own opinion, but some people might use, say, the Affordable Care Act as an example. The Affordable Care Act depended in part upon cooperation from among the states, and many states refused to cooperate with it, including Oklahoma. And because of that, the Affordable Care Act was never fully implemented and was never fully successful. So what we're going to find is that if you really like the Affordable Care Act and you think this is a good policy, you might not like federalism because federalism prevented that policy from passing. 
Similarly, the federal government may want to create a standardized practice for curriculums across education in the United States, but individual states have their own ideas about what students ought to be taught. And that means that instructors are going to provide different information to students in Oklahoma than instructors are going to provide to students in Texas. So if I'm an employer and I'm trying to hire people from across different states, I don't necessarily know what each potential employee has already been taught by the public education system unless I go and I carefully research every state's separate curriculum. Finally, we've got what's called the race to the bottom. Remember on the previous slide that I told you states compete with one another to try and attract one another's citizens? Well, that's true, and that can create improvement in things like cost of living. But it is argued by some, though not necessarily proven in the empirical record, that states may also race to the bottom, meaning that in order to attract not just citizens but businesses, states might do things like slash their taxes. And if they slash their taxes, they might wind up with less money to do things like build roads or pay teachers. And as a result, the well-being of their citizens, measured by infrastructure and education, might actually decline due to federalism. And some people don't think that that's fair because it creates a certain degree of inequality. Remember that I also told you that Texas has one of the nation's best education systems. And while Oklahoma's education system probably isn't bad as you might think, it's not great. It definitely needs to be improved. And it's definitely not standing up to the education system in Texas. So what that means is that if you live in Texas, then you are simply going to have a better education than somebody who lives in Oklahoma. Now maybe that Okie is just as deserving and just as intelligent, but simply by virtue of where he or she was born, he or she may not go to a school that's quite as nice as yours. And this is true even inside of individual states. If you look at Oklahoma, for example, you might go to a school in a district that is really, really nice, but your neighbor down the street may wind up being in a school district that is really, really, really weak. And simply because he or she lives in that district, he or she doesn't get as good of an education as you in the better school district. And some people say that that unfairness is not acceptable. So what we're going to find is that these school districts and this system of federalism can, as the argument goes, create a great deal of inequality. And that pretty much brings us to an end for our lecture this week. Make sure you complete all of your graded assignments, and I'll catch you on the next one.